multitasking, um, admitting people into this room and um, having drinks with you all. And this is Cocktails and Courageous Conversations. And the idea came from uh, that I have the honor of knowing these amazing people. And sometimes we go out for a drink, don't we, Ross Harris? We go out for a drink. <laughs> Uh, non non-alcoholic drink, not obviously. Alcoholic. Uh, we've never uh, kind of, that. Yeah. Like we've never done that. But if we, yeah. uh, we'd have a, you know, kind of maybe different chat than we have when we're doing trainings, and so my um, my intention was to have kind of an informal chat about something that is, of course, is very can be very serious and and is very important, and then we wanted to bring our friends from all over the world, and literally we have people from all over the world joining us, Russ Harris. People are in the middle of the night, some of us in the morning. You are, it's eight o'clock where you are, right, isn't it? It is eight o'clock in my third month of lockdown in Melbourne. <laughs> and you know, we'll, we, we don't know, are you wearing pants? <laughs> <laughs> Some well, things have to stay secret, no, Ricky. Exactly. You know, the, the, the questions are already getting personal. <laughs> So I, let's, first, let's first hear Russ Harris. I see you're you're drinking champagne, aren't you? Well, a cheap Australian imitation of champagne. And apparently, the French have told us that we're we're not allowed to call it champagne. It's good. Oh, right, champagne. Right. champagne, champagne, champagne. champagne. Oh, oh, so, so, yeah, yeah. oh, 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 we're getting oh, a, we're getting a that's funny, a funny echo. echo. Funny echo. Funny. So we might invite people to turn off their microphones. Oh, is that what it is? I think oh, right. that's what it is. I think that's what it oh. is. Oh, you could hear it too. I thought it was the voices coming back. Okay. All right. Yeah. No, no, no. Did you take your pills today? <laughs> uh, some of them. Some of yes. them. All right. And so, uh, all right. And so if you have any messages for us, just put them in the, in the, in the chat. We'll try to handle everything uh, as we go and just know that although we will try to be octopus <laughs> sometimes we can't so russ harris good to see you oh and you too you and, too ricky and so I'm, Rick, I'm, <laughs> can i call you ricky moose is that uh, a moose. so for all the danish people they will know that you know my nickname is reggae moose and russ likes to call me that and it sounds it's pretty pretty danish you know, your Danish is so good. So Russ, I've known tack, you for <laughs> <tack. laughs> okay. I've known you for a long while. And uh, and so could you introduce yourself? I, you know, I think everybody knows who you are, but how would you like I meet you in a bar, I come up to you with a drink and I say hello. And I say, <laughs> oh, what were you then? Uh, who are you? Oh my God, it's been a long time since someone's done that to me in a bar. Um <laughs> Uh, well, see, you, you kind of, you put me on the spot right then and there, um, right now, right here and now, right here and now, you put me on the spot. Uh, it, it immediately, uh, I'm feeling a flood of anxiety. Gosh, how do I even begin, begin to describe myself? I'd probably just say, hi, I'm Russ. Yeah. Um, who are you? <laughs> What's that you're drinking? Can so I have one? Please. <laughs> what are you drinking? And so <laughs> I, I, I think I, I know you quite well. And I know what happens to you when I say, oh, my God, Ross, you're a superstar. Everybody knows Russ Harris. You've written a oh. billion books. Exactly. Yeah, so what happens yes. now then? Well, as soon as you say that, you know, getting anxiety shows up, instant imposter syndrome, you know, it's like, uh, I'm glad you haven't done the big spiel that people often do, you know, Russ is this and Russ has done that, blah, 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 blah. Because um, it just, uh, uh, you know, I, 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 I mean, talk about insecurity um, as the topic of the evening. Any kind of uh, praise or, or uh, along those lines just immediately kind of taps into that and brings up imposter syndrome and, oh, gosh, and, 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 and fear, you know. It's, uh, uh, it's like, oh, oh, my God, they've just said all these amazing things about me. How do I possibly live up to, to those expectations? expectations so um uh <laughs> I, don't, I just normally you know introduce myself as russ hi i'm russ and see where the conversation goes you know uh, and so why do you think this is like literally in my book 
uh, you're, you are a superstar and, you know, you have written all these books and you give all these talks and, you know, I don't know if people know this, but you are also a very nice person. Uh, I know I told about this before. The last time I told people about this, you know, I was crying because I went through a hard time and you were the one who reached out to me, like from Australia. You called me in the morning, you called me in the night and you were so caring and considerate. So behind all of this, fame thing there is a really really beautiful person um mm. and i think i hope people see that i just want to you know really reinforce that you are much more than the famous superstar that's the famous superstar, <laughs> well, superstar. Uh, <laughs> and my friend yeah. and partnering crime and all of that um why is it then like when you have accomplished all of that and like most of us have written like maybe a blog or, uh, you know, have maybe not done all the things you've done. And, you know, most of us are feeling totally imposter and insecure and self-doubtful. How, how is it then that we feel all of this? Like you, like you, I would say, well, how can you feel that you've accomplished all this and that? So is it universal? I think it's pretty much universal, isn't it? I mean, I mean, it always depends on, I mean, one factor is at what level you compare yourself on, you know, like I'm, I'm sure that the vast majority of people here can ride a bicycle. Just wave your hands. If you can ride a bike, just wave your hands. Those of you can ride a bicycle. See, I can't ride a bike. You know, I, uh, I, I, I first went on a bicycle when I was about 30 years old and I've been on a bicycle about five or six times since then, you know, and, and I, I can stay up for about two minutes before I fall off. So I look at all these folks riding bicycles and I go, wow, that's amazing. How do they do that? You know? Um, so, so, you know, if someone wants to compare themselves to me in terms of the number of books that have been written, then obviously there may be a discrepancy there there but you know there's so many other areas that you can compare yourself to other people um and uh, of course this is one of the problems that uh, the act deals with all the time doesn't it because you know you you kind of um uh, even if your mind uh compares you positively to someone on on this facet or factor or element it's going to compare you negatively to someone on something else uh you know so i i love the the kind of act chessboard metaphor you know the the idea that you've got all these positive thoughts and feelings on one side of the chessboard and all these negative thoughts and feelings on the other side of the chessboard and you you, you go through life playing this battle trying to get the 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 positive uh pieces to kind of dominate the board and wipe out all the negative pieces but you know the the problem is that there's an infinite number of positive and negative pieces so the battle's never won and, and the other problem is that the positive pieces actually attract negative pieces so you know i move the positive piece oh well ricky says that i'm a nice person and it attracts the negative piece well no you're not what about the time you did this and what about the time you yelled at your son and what about the time you blah 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 you know without going into details because this is going to be shown on youtube so uh you know um i I, you know, I, I, I think, um, I think it's pretty universal. I, 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 perhaps Donald Trump doesn't have any self doubts or self judgments, but I think, you know, most people do. Uh, and, uh, yeah, more seriously, of course, narcissists do have, uh, self doubts and, and, uh, but they, but they, they work very hard at pushing them away and holding on to I'm wonderful and fantastic because they're actually so threatened by those kind of self doubts and self judgments. So, um, um, certainly seems universal in my experience. What, what about you, Ricky? Do you, yeah, uh, I, 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 I think it's it, it might it, I think it is very universal I kind of see it everywhere and for sure I know it myself uh, every time I do a training I wonder why people even show up to my trainings or even want to want to listen to me and it's just like there's this uh, constant war and one thing that I noticed that you just did so I put you on the spot kind of deliberately <laughs> and, and anxiety went up and I saw you feeling anxious and not running away like you literally stayed with your anxiety what is that like for you and me this might be obvious but what could you put like some words to what it is that you were doing because most people would run away when they felt anxious or leave the webinar or be like 
turn on the computer. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do that, can I? Um, well, you know, yeah, I, I uh, well, you know, what did I do? I noticed that's a really good question. I noticed uh, I, I noticed that I had like knots in my stomach and my hands were kind of very sweaty. I don't know if, if the camera can pick that up right now, but they've kind of got a, th a thin layer of sweat on them. They're quite red. Is the camera picking that up or, or not really? Anyway, um, and um, oh, are you going to keep this in a multi-screen view or are you going to go more to uh, a conversational uh, view, by the way? So right now I see you, like only you, you are, uh, you are, you are being recorded. And oh, I so see you right. choose okay. what you see at your end. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm watching the whole thing now so I can yeah. see all the reactions. I can make sure people laugh at my bad jokes. Yes. And, uh, and if they don't, then I've got their email addresses. Exactly. So. Then we'll email them. Bam! Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, yeah so, so, yeah, I guess, uh, I mean, without really even thinking about it, I was just kind of, you know, letting the anxiety be there, accepting it. I, I guess, I, I mean, I've got a lot of track record of accepting anxiety in public forums because, uh, you know, it doesn't matter how many talks or workshops I give, I always get high levels of anxiety in, in any kind of public speaking capacity. Um, so, uh, so I'm just very, very practiced. And I guess, you know, one of the nice things about ACT is it allows me to kind of be open about that and explicit about that. The, the number of public forums that I've shown people my sweaty hands uh, is, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, so if you ever come to a workshop with me, make sure you sit in the front row so you can get a view of the, the sweaty hands. It's a and bring a towel. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, it just, uh, I, I mean, I remember thinking, you know, years gone by that maybe I'd reach a point where I no longer felt anxious public speaking, but I, I, I've given up on that. I just, uh, it's just part and parcel, you, you know, of, of, uh, of that experience. And, um, it's, um, it's actually for me, uh, it's higher. My anxiety is higher in, in small social situations than in big ones. So, but, you know, so if, I, if I'm talking in front of an audience of 2000 people, that's actually nowhere near as anxiety provoking as a one on one conversation with someone or, or a one on two conversation. Um, so, you know, it's um, uh, earlier in my life, uh, you know, social anxiety used to have a, a huge impact on me and stop me doing a lot of things or uh, played a big role in the heavy drinking that I did when I was younger before I discovered artificial Australian champagne. Oh yes. Mm. Cheers to that. Uh, Cheers to artificial Australian <laughs> champagne. Um, and uh, um, you know, uh, but now it, now much less so, you know, uh, I, it still holds me back. It's uh, you, you know, you know, Ricky, how I kind of tend to hide at act conferences a bit and sneak out the back door and find a few people like yourself to kind of, um, because, you know, I just find it so anxiety provoking that kind of, uh, uh, you know, but at least I go to the conferences. So, you know, yes. and, 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 and the thing, one of the thing I saw you do was also, and this is like, because this is what you and me both teach. We teach ACT both like for clinicians and you and me we see patients, clients, and you just sat with anxiety. I think that was, that was the thing that is uh, beautiful and brilliant. You just literally walked the talk. You practiced what you preach. Uh, so every day you and I are on stage or the similar talking to people about willingness and being willing to be with what is. And you just did that. And I just, uh, I just find it so beautiful when people practice what they preach and you at, are at, at, <laughs> at times. So my mind's at going, times. yeah, but what about all the other times that I don't practice what I preach, you know? Well, hello, greatest hits of imposter <laughs> syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the lovely thing about having a teenage son. You know, my son is so quick to point out to me the ways that I don't practice what I preach. It's not very act, dad, you know? And I'm like, oh, well, thank you for um, giving me that very <laughs> valuable feedback, son. Yes, I, I really appreciate that. <laughs> now get to your room! <laughs> you know, uh, so it's, uh, you know, in my defense, the one thing that I, you know, I, when my son kind of uh, gives me a hard time, I'll say, look, you know what? You're right. I wasn't practicing what I preached. And, 
And, and the thing is that, you know, ACT encourages us to own up to that, admit it and apologize. So, you know, it's, uh, it's like, uh, you know, we don't pretend to be perfect or have it all sorted. We, we kind of acknowledge that we're, we're flawed and we'll screw things up, you know, and, and so, uh, uh, you know, it's a nice out, <laughs> but, uh, um, it, you know, but it's true as well. I mean, it's one of the things that I love about ACT is, is that we're not, we're not perfectionists and we're not trying to always you know live our i mean in in the ideal world we'd be living our values mindfully accepting diffused compassionate but of course no one's really like that all the time you know maybe, maybe the dalai lama or someone uh, so we will screw up and we will do things imperfectly and you know there will be lots of times that we don't practice what we preach in terms of act but we can get better and better at kind of remembering that, remembering what's important, coming back to it, owning up, uh, you know, apologizing for our mistakes, making amends, you know, get back on track and, and start walking the walk again, even though we just went off track. And having compassion for the, for the mistakes. Yeah, compassion yeah. for ourselves, compassion yeah. for others. So yeah. what is... What is imposters like? I can I come to you. So we, I met you in a bar. Now we get a little acquainted. I know that you fancy, you know, Australian champagne, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I know your name is Ross. I know you have great hair. Yeah. We cover uh -huh. that, and and so I'm asking you, like, what is? Oh, I hear you are. Uh, you know, I hear you're very smart. I hear you're very clever. Uh, what is? <laughs> and here we go again. Oh. What is, what is imposter syndrome? What, if you were to explain this to me in a bar, what is imposter yeah. syndrome? Uh, you know, that, that sense that you're a fraud, a fake, uh, an imposter, that you're going to get found out any moment that people are going to see through you, realize that you, you don't really know what you're talking about and you're nothing like what they expect you to be. Um, and, uh, you know, what I what I find is that if you if you talk about this to most people, most people actually immediately then respond and and and, and open up and and uh, so refreshing that so someone else is kind of talking about something that that most of us uh, know very well, very intimately. Um, but you know, I do occasionally meet people who just kind of look at you with a blank face and, and don't know what you're you know. Uh, uh, and and I wonder about that, you know, are there, are there some people that just don't have insecurity or what I think is that they're, they're just not tuned into it. They're not really aware of it, that, uh, that it's kind of uh, their insecurity is, is, is playing out um, in their life, but they're just not aware of it. No. Um, Let's see, have you encountered that? Do we have any imposters in here? I'm just going to switch to data review. And so hands up all the imposters in here. <laughs> awesome. yeah. Yes. I'm just going to share. There's a lot. Uh, there are some imposters in here. Yes. So, so this like feeling of, oh my God, if they knew me well, or if they really saw what I was doing, they would know that I don't know. I always have like, I have, I have, I literally, I have all the act books. I have all the act books and I haven't read all of them, but I think. Oh my God. And I, but I think there are photos of me, like in front of all the books. <laughs> I have a picture of myself with all of the act books, but I have not read them. And I'm just, I'm just sure that everybody else in the world has read every single book. <laughs> you just absorb it you know you just put them in your bookcase and it just yes. absorbs into your head you know, yes you sleep next to them and then that you know <laughs> get into your head yeah. so what i just put i pointed at you know, talking of imposter syndrome i just pointed to the bookcase you know so at, but those are not at books those are all uh graphic novels that's like wolverine and the walking dead and kind of zombie comics and stuff like that but you know probably if i hadn't said that people go oh look at his bookcase wow that's a that's a lot of books isn't it yeah. He, so he must be smart um, <laughs> but you know Rick, ricky it's not really a a problem if you haven't read all the app books because they're all the same right i know 
<laughs> Hans have you had the experience of reading the latest that book and going, oh my God, this is just the same thing. Who's, who's yeah. a, I mean, how many times can you hear passengers on the bus or, you know, uh, tuning into your values, you know? And you know, okay. yeah, so, and, and, but they all have a different tone to it. And so yeah. seeing now that we're about 200 imposters in here at this, at the same town, like 200 frogs sitting here, what would you like, if you were to give us some good advice, like Ross Harris himself advising us. <laughs> <laughs> when, About what? <laughs> a good advice. Uh, well, um, uh, you know, Australian champagne is half the price of French champagne and just as good. Uh, so, uh, well, actually, I don't know. In other countries, it might be expensive. Uh, you know, it's quite funny. We got we got some like really cheap, low class wines here that uh, that in England are kind of like, oh wow, Australian wine, and you pay through the roof for it. You know, uh, so uh, um, uh, so yeah, that would be my advice: buy Australian champagne uh, rather than French champagne. And, yes. Um, uh, and so that's uh, what you say to a pa the patient comes to you. <laughs> <laughs> massive imposter syndrome and you encourage them to drink i love it <laughs> <laughs> it works for me uh no uh do you mean about insecurity is that is that, that advice about insecurity so like we, oh there's a lot of people in here and you know we all feel in, like a fraud in different forms ah, okay well, you weren't specific you just said what advice do you have you didn't say advice about what you know well i, just... I love the I, I actually love your advice like the when I asked <laughs> Harris, what would you like if you were to give me advice you you go drink just drink <laughs> that would be the first and after uh... that <laughs> Well, you know, a younger me would have given you that advice for sure. You know, they're like the, you know, I'm, I'm in, in a few hours time, I turn 54. And, uh, That's yes. true, it's your birthday. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, if I think back to the 25 year old me, I mean, that's exactly the advice that, that he would have given, you know, it's like, oh, stop whinging, get drunk, you know, yeah. it's, uh, uh, which uh, was quite workable in my mid twenties, <laughs> but no longer. Um, so, look, insecurity. What advice would I give? Well, I mean, the first thing is 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 to acknowledge it. I mean, I, 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 I humans are the insecure animal. We we um, we're just so aware of all the things that could go wrong, uh, and there's no way to switch off that knowledge. Uh, you know from what is it am i you know from about age two you become aware of of uh, you have this capacity to kind of predict bad things happening and and it just gets better and better as you get older you know and uh, what what are, most kids are aware of the concept of death by about four is it four or five you know uh, that they start to understand that concept so it's um we you know we know we're gonna die we know there's all sorts of bad things that are gonna happen so you know uh, we know uh, that no matter what we have right here right now it can be gone tomorrow it can be gone in an instant uh, you know existential angst uh, uh, you know the existentialists talk about this death anxiety this uh, uh, you know awareness that we're small and insignificant in the face of this vast cosmos and relatively powerless and and life is short and you know uh so that kind of insecurity uh is inbuilt in, into into being human um uh and i guess um I guess when we talk about insecurity, we often don't talk of it in that broader sense. We often talk it more at a kind of interpersonal level, um, not secure in who I am or not secure in my relationships. Um, but, the, but that basic uh, idea of insecurity that, that you know, is um, uh, there's no way to get rid of it. it. It's always there. You can't have security other than through delusion and by kidding yourself that, you know, everything's fine and it will remain this way. So kind of noticing, acknowledging, it, allowing it to be there um, is a good start. Uh, and, and then a step further, I guess, kind of compassion. You know, it's hard to be human. It's hard to have that insecurity. It's painful. And extending that compassion to 
yourself and to others, you know. Are there any benefits, Ross, from having self-doubt? Do you think there are any benefits to it? Well, um, I think, uh, yeah, I think that there's huge benefits. I remember a, a few years ago now, it was two or three years ago, reading research that therapists high in self-doubt were much better than therapists that were extremely self-confident. Uh, providing that they also had high self-compassion. Mm -hmm. So the best therapists were ones that were high in self-doubt and also high in self-compassion. Um, therapists that were high in self-doubt but had little or no self-compassion were not very effective. So if you, if you were kind of able to acknowledge your uh, self-doubt, your insecurity, whatever you want to call it, then it becomes a friend, an ally. It's like it's telling me not to be too cocky here, not to assume that I know everything, to be alert, to be prepared for things that may go wrong or backfire, to question my methods and question what I'm doing so I don't get overconfident or uh, rest on my laurels. Um, so uh, as long as I can kind of acknowledge that and be kind to myself then my self-doubt becomes an ally um, uh, and makes me a better therapist than a therapist that doesn't have that because the danger is if you if you have no self-doubt uh, you become overconfident you can become cocky you can assume that you know all the answers and uh, as soon as you start doing that you become blind to all the things that you don't know and and all your kind of human fallibilities um, but if you if you are not able to be compassionate to yourself with that uh, with that self doubt, then what happens is you start fusing with I'm a lousy, stupid therapist, and I don't know what I'm doing, and then you may become driven by your fear, and you know um, actually start performing worse as a therapist. So it's like, um, I, I, I mean, uh, from an app perspective, really any difficult emotion or cognition uh, can become our ally if we respond to it with openness, curiosity, diffusion, acceptance, self-compassion. All of these difficult private experiences can be useful. And I think um, insecurity can be, be especially, uh, especially useful in just... Uh, uh, um, as an antidote to, to overconfidence or, um, uh, you know, just what's the opposite of insecurity? That's security. <laughs> That's not such a bad thing, but, uh, but, you know, as an antidote to kind of overconfidence to, to, uh, you know, blind confidence to, uh, egotism, narcissism, arrogance, that kind of stuff. It, it's, uh, it's a, a buffer, um, you know, uh, I think, what do you think? Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And and one of the things that I'm sitting here thinking about as we speak, uh, one of the things that I use a lot when I work is uh, self-disclosure. Um, and um, and I get less asked a lot, like how how do you how much do you use self-disclosure? When do you use it? When do you not use it? I was wondering when you are with your patients, clients, and they're feeling insecure and et cetera, et cetera. Would you then let them know that you know that you share that with them? Do you use self-disclosure on your own self -death? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I think self-disclosure is such an important. And it was, you know, it was one of the things that I fell in love with when I discovered ACT was that, uh, you know, I, I, Steve Hayes was the first person I, I saw presenting act and he was just doing so much self-disclosure about his own anxiety and his panic attacks and all this kind of stuff and i was like wow you know i've never seen this in a workshop before uh and, and uh, you know it, it's so normalizing and validating for most people uh you know because because clients come to therapy and they've got this idea that the therapist has got their life sorted out and has no problems right you know uh and so uh uh, if we can start to kind of open up and share our struggles and our doubts and our difficulties, uh, that's, uh, you know, often goes a long way towards validating the, the client's experience. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, always uh, the, the question with self-disclosure, I mean, I get asked that question a lot too, you know, is, is it in the service of the client? Is this likely to, to benefit and help the client? If I'm just doing self-disclosure because I just had a big fight with my partner and I want to get it off my chest, you know, 
that's not really act appropriate. It's like, you got to ask, you know, is this going to help the client with this specific issue? And, and it's got to be appropriate, you know, appropriate self-disclosure. It's not, you think, you think you've got sexual problems? Listen to mine. You know, it's always got to be, uh, you know, in terms of, is this relevant, useful, helpful for the client? And I, and I think it, uh, you know, uh, when, when I've been a client myself in therapy, um, I have found it, I've seen quite a few therapists over the years and always found the ones that, uh, that did use self-disclosure was, it was always such a powerful experience for me as a client. Um, I guess it's that human connection, isn't it? You know, it's that kind of, yeah. Um, so, and you, and so I think I, I think too, like now, so I was asking you what you do when you see clients, but uh, I've seen you uh, a bazillion times doing workshops and, and, and I, I also know that I know you. So of course, there are things that you don't wouldn't share. But I think your audience's experience would be like, they feel like they know you, they know your son, you bring your son uh, into your workshops, you talk about Max and, and the feelings that it, you know, it shows up in you. And, and so you have a very personal way of teaching, I think, and letting your audience in, which I think is beautiful. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so again, my mind's going, oh yeah, but what about all the crap stuff? Uh, you know, um, it's, uh, yeah, well, you know, I, I mean, again, so, so Steve was the first person I saw doing act, and then Kelly Wilson was the second uh, person I saw, you know, and he was talking about his life and all his heroin use and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then I felt, well, I haven't got any dramatic stories like that to tell. <laughs> it's kind of like, comparing with my self-disclosure is not good enough. You know, what can I talk about? Sweaty hands, you know, what, what's that? You know, why didn't I use some heroin when I was younger? Oh, you know. uh, but um, I, I think, uh, um, you know, I mean, this is one of the lovely things about ACT, isn't it? I, I, I think the therapy uh, often... I think therapies often reflect the personalities of the creators, you know, and if you look at Steve and Kelly uh, and Kirk, uh, you know, they're so um, open about their stuff and, and so, uh, so real. And, you know, Carl Rogers talked about being authentic and congruent as a therapist. I think, I think he would be, uh, I think he'd be quite happy with the kind of act stance on that. Um, I agree. I agree. All right. So Russ, there, there's a lot of people here and I wanted to give people the opportunity to, you know, hang out with you and have a drink. And, and so if there's any questions and so let's see how this goes, cause we can just have people come on. And if like 200 people comes on at the same time, we're going to have to monitor this differently, <laughs> but um, until that happens. So if anyone has a question for, uh, Russ or myself wants to come on, say something. And so just put on your uh, microphone, turn on your microphone, turn on your camera, get into the bar with us. Let's have a cheers. School, Russ. School. So I noticed in the chat someone asked, is, is imposter syndrome evenly distributed amongst genders? That's a really good question. I, I would imagine so. Uh, I, I would also imagine uh, that culturally it's it's more acceptable for women to admit to it than men um but i don't know um you know it's it certainly if you i like uh, reading interviews with uh, famous people um that own up to this you know it's not very common but from time to time you'll hear rock stars i remember robbie williams talking about this um i remember kylie minogue talking about this uh, you'll hear actors talking about it and so forth um don't usually hear athletes talking about it very much though um it's uh so um but my, my sense of basing it on you know on on clients and what i see in the media i i yeah, my sense is that women are more willing to talk about it, which is not surprising because, you know, we find the same things with depression and anxiety and so forth. 
Um, oh, uh, great answer. So we have, uh, I'm not sure to pronounce this correct. I, I will pronounce it in, in uh, Swedish. Roland. Roland. Roland has raised his hand. Come on on and talk to us. Where is he? Where is he? Where is, is he? he Where is he gone? Come on. <laughs> Hello. So He's just literally unmute yourself and start talking to us. And it can be, oh, somebody asked, must it, does it have to be uh, a, a question related to self-doubt? It could be any question. Like there are. Most uh, sorry, sorry. No, I, I will not take questions about hair products. Well, I'm you, sorry. You, you promised me you promised me you would. Take, you know, <laughs> you are here for your hair, Ross Harris. Now, uh, well, I, I'm sorry. You know, we we've had no hair salons or hairdressers open for three months here in Melbourne, so uh, <laughs> it's not quite my uh, my usual panache. But um, I, my apologies for that, folks. So. Questions about hair are kind of off the table, <laughs> but other than that, <laughs> any questions? So there's somebody who raised his hand. Uh, is it Amber? Amber. Amber's waving a hand. There we go. Okay, come on. Let me unmute. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Hello. Hello. I was just wondering, Ross, I'm, I'm in Melbourne too. It's dark outside. Oh, yeah. Uh. Um, so in this lockdown, oof. Three months now, so it's been a while. Uh, how do you go doing ACT via telehealth? Because I've been into telehealth now with kids and boy, is it rough. <laughs> <laughs> telehealth is hard. I mean, it's, you know, uh, for it's, it's tiring. It's, uh, it's not the same degree of connection. Um, I find it hard. Everyone I've spoken to finds it hard. Um, you know, I, I mean, you everything in act you can do via telehealth, um, but the, there's no doubt it's it's more challenging. Uh, and um, uh, I guess you know there are some advantages to it. Um, the you know, for example, it's much easier to do exposure with people when they're at home and they can you know uh, uh, kind of. Uh, do their kind of exposure tasks while you're guiding them through it. Um, it's, uh, um, I think also there's, um, you know, while there's that kind of disconnection, it's also somebody does get a little bit of a view into your life. They usually, you know, get to see my dog jumping around in the background and sometimes, you know, uh, embarrassing things happen, you know, with my son being at home and doing homeschooling and things like that. So there's, there's, there's some, you know, there's, there's some little kind of bits of openness and humanity in there. Look, it's hard. It's challenging. You know, uh, I, I keep reading about this kind of Zoom effect and different people's theories about why we're so tired after looking at a screen and doing, you know, Zoom sessions. Uh, and, you know, there's different theories about that. I, I, I think the, the theory that appeals to me most is this idea that it's just so much harder to read all the, the little mannerisms and emotional expressions and postures that you're just concentrating harder looking at this screen. I, I, I don't know that that, 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 that makes sense to me. Uh, and I certainly do get that kind of sense of, of tiredness and intense concentration that I don't get one-on-one, -on -one. you know, I mean, it gives a certain degree of flexibility um, that, um, uh, but I mean, I don't want to say it's, it's hard, it's challenging, but you can do everything in act, uh, that you want to do, uh, via, via, um, you know, um, zoom and so forth. Uh, I, I feel like I'm rambling. Uh, am I answering your question or am I just rambling? I am. Yeah, no, no, it's great. It's great to hear your perspective, Russ. Thanks. Uh, how do you find it? Um, I, I was working with um, adults and kids and I found that the kids was a lot harder. Adults will do the exercises with you on Zoom. Kids, I had, you know, a little 11-year-old who just ran off. You know, just yeah. off he goes. I was sort of like, hello. <laughs> <laughs> so, a bit hard. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. 
And so one, one, thank you so much, Amber, for that question. That's so cool. And, and Russ, as you were talking about um, uh, that, you know, the humanity part that sometimes our kids and et cetera, I don't know, half the time your Luna, your dog has been uh, uh, stealing the show. Now, now, now asleep, but earlier people were commenting like the dog. It's uh, Luna, isn't it? Yes, yeah, yeah I'll yes. go and grab her. I'll go and grab her. <laughs> He is wearing pants. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh. oh, so sweet. Um, oops. I, I've had Zoom meetings with you and your dog and your partner and everything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus. She's doing her duty here. There we go. Oh, dogs so are special. Some questions here, Ross. Uh, somebody yeah. asked. Um, for, well, somebody asked, can you, can you ask personal questions? It, it, you can ask everything you want to. So, so you can ask anything. Uh, and it's up to Ross and myself whether we answer, but uh, you can ask. <laughs> you can ask. So, somebody uh, asked, how would you do a similar ex experiential exercise like pushing paper away in telehealth? You can't push the paper in a video call. So oh, you, you what would your, yeah. What yeah, would yeah, your no, no, answer no. be? I get that all uh. the time. What, what would, what yeah, well, it's like, so what I would say, you're, you're my client, I say, grab a sheet of paper, and I'll, I've got a sheet of paper in my hand, and you've got a sheet of paper at your hand, and now push as hard as you can, push, 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 and this is what it's like when you're trying to push your feelings away, notice how tiring it is, notice how distracting it is, notice my triceps showing through my t-shirt from all my gym workouts, push, push really hard, and notice that, and then drop it on your lap. And notice the difference and you know it, it's exactly the same as doing it one-on-one -on -one. it's um you know all of almost all the experiential exercises in act can easily be done you just the client just uh it, it, the only exceptions would be if it's a very specific prop that the client's not likely to have i mean clients have got a piece of paper yeah. um something like chinese finger traps you couldn't do because most clients are not going to have a set of Chinese finger traps, but certainly things like pushing a white paper or hands as thoughts, um, you know, a metaphor like tug of war, you can't actually kind of do, but, but, um, but you can certainly talk about uh, metaphorically, you know, if you're in a tug of war, the monster, you're pulling and they're pulling, you know, what would you do? And so I, 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 and to that, I would like to add one of the things that I'm so, when I'm teaching act is that, um, I want, I, I would, I wish for therapists to get out of this, like, oh, so the metaphor to do is pushing away paper. Uh, yeah. So to get out of a specific technique or metaphor and see that the function is important. So you want to do something that serves a certain function. And if you know the, the model, and if you know what functions you are trying to, you know, uh, uh, work on and what transformations you want, I think it's quite easy to be pretty creative when it comes to telehealth and and it, there are so many things you can do just wanted to say yeah. that uh like people ask about pushing away pay, pushing paper away i think that's kind of a ross harris people you are known for the pushing paper away <laughs> that's and what i'm gonna be famous for, the, for you know for the on record, my tombstone here lies record, russ he, he pushed do, away paper <laughs> do a bazillion other things i know that so but just know that you want to track the function and then move that to the whatever it is that you're doing and so yeah, that, yeah. I yeah. mean, that's so, so true. This, I mean, there's just so many different ways of, of doing it. We, we do get overly attached to our favorite kind of metaphors. And, and so you always want to have backups. Um, exactly. And so I have, uh, oh, I, it, this is one of my students, Ross, asking, uh, you talked about using self-disclosure when it's like to, likely to be in the service of the client. When would you say that self-disclosure isn't helpful? when when it's not helpful um well you know so uh <laughs> um well so firstly if it's inappropriate in the detail like for example if you were starting to talk about your uh um if you're starting to go into too much personal detail that's way beyond the point of what's necessary to kind of normalize and validate the client's experience um Secondly, if you were talking about yourself and you weren't tuning into the fact that the client's deeply distressed and, and, and what they really need right now is not to hear a story about you, but some work with grounding or dropping anchor or acceptance or self-compassion. Um, 
so uh, um, you, you know, really any time where you're, where you're kind of uh, caught up in self-disclosure to the extent that you're ignoring what's going on for the client. Um, uh, those would be the, those would be the main indicators and probably uh, come up with others, but um, uh, Rick, hey, anything that you would add to that? Yeah, I think, I think, you know, it's, I think it's all a matter of function. Again, as you said, if you, if you do it to get something off your own chest, it might not be uh, workable, but if you do it to bring the clients or so, or, you know, to, to get in that common space. And also you want to be aware of how it, like how it lands. You want to track the behaviors of the client. If the client goes, Oh, I'm sorry. And you know, all of that, then, you know, you might want to put a few more words to that. So I think, you know, I think your answer is brilliant. I have somebody. Oh, I, I brilliant. Just, just brilliant. It's not, just not brilliant. truly brilliant. Or? Like, like a true yeah. rock star. Right. <laughs> I have a good one here. Ricky, 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 Ricky. So let's just talk about compliments because, yeah. you know, you're giving me all these compliments and, and it's like when you give them to me, it just, it triggers um, anxiety and embarrassment. Um, and, you know, it's like, uh, uh, you know, it's, 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 for me, it's kind of like, it's like being on the Starship Enterprise in Star Trek. It's like, compliment deflector shields on full. No, no, compliments coming through. No, Captain, don't let me. And it's kind of, um, uh, 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 you know, compliments are, are a bit of a double-edged sword. Uh, you know, um, let, let's talk about how, how do you find receiving compliments? I have learned uh, that you don't have to believe, you just have to receive. This is actually, <laughs> this, is, this is something that Robin Walsh said to me once. And I have, because I, I think that compliments, like for me, I get that a lot, that I am a person who gives compliments a lot. And I have, I give compliments to give compliments. Like I would, I'll, I'll hear some clients going that they are very compliment. I don't compliment. I don't understand. They give compliments a lot to get them back. And I don't do that. I do them to give. So it's kind of an act of love. And I know with you, because <laughs> I know you, <laughs> I know what it does. Uh, and so, and so um, one of the things that, so if you were my client, uh, I would keep doing this as an exposure and have you, <laughs> and literally compliment have therapy. <laughs> compliment <laughs> therapy. But I would do that. I do this in therapy as well. I use compassion to it. Yeah, this is whatever it is that I'm doing. Now it's compliments. It evokes something in you. Uh, and uh, I, my invitation is for you to receive it and sit with it. And you don't have to believe it. Just, how, uh, do you, how do you go uh, when people compliment you? I mean, you get showered with compliments about it, your great it, it work. It really depends and... on it. It depends on what it is. If people compliment me for, uh, it really depends on what it is. Uh, sometimes, sometimes people would say something about my body, and I get pretty offended. Like, like, and I, I there's, I think there might be a gender. Uh, it might be different, but I have come up workshops when people go, Oh, you have so beautiful breasts. And I'm like, shut. you like, what? You know, what? So, <laughs> oh. and I was like, I hope I brought more to this than a pair of, you know, <laughs> And sometimes, yeah. people... I, Ricky, I get that all the time. People say, "Russ, you've got lovely breasts. I love your breasts, really." And I'm like, "Really? Is is is? What about the hair? You know?" Yeah. And uh, and so, but I get really offended by that. And yeah. and, and if people are talking, people <laughs> I'm say, shocked. I'm... Yeah, but you. <laughs> You are outrageous. You have I'm no sure. idea the things that yeah. sometimes people will say to one, and so. But, but if people uh, give me a compliment uh, about how smart I am, I go through the roof in imposter, like because I'm literally I'm not smart. I'm I'm very in fact I'm very stupid. So that gets me off. If people give me compliments about how things are useful. I really take them in. It doesn't, it's, it's, mm, I, it's just, ah, oh, that's nice. Well, see that, you know, I relate to that because like, if someone says, oh, that was so helpful. That was so useful. I really loved the way you said that or did that. Then I can take it. Uh, and I've got no problem. But if someone says you're smart or you're clever or you're this, that or the other, then it, 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 so there's a difference between you and 
what you're giving or what you're doing. Exactly, you know. exactly, exactly. And my point, exactly. That's why I keep talking to you like a rock star because I know it gets you off your chair. <laughs> Uh, and so, I'm curious to see if other people relate to that. Uh, just wave your hands if you find it much easier to take a compliment about something that you've done rather than who you are. It's kind of, yeah, interesting, isn't it? You know. And so again, I, I think there's something going on here. I'm, I'm, I'm making this up as I go, so this may be complete rubbish, but I think there's something here about you know our, our kind of our sense of self, our conceptualized self. Uh, you know, and, and a compliment comes in uh, about ourself and who we are. That's a whole different ball game uh, than, you know, a compliment about something that we've done or something we put out there. It's me, it's myself, you know. Yeah. Um, and I know we talked about this and we joke about this, but it's really interesting when people give us compliments about how we look as and when we are working. I find that very interesting. And again, pretty, mm -hmm. pretty offending. Uh, yes. Yeah. And so, okay, so um, uh, talking about how we look, the last time you and me were together, I accident, well, not accident, I happened to have a dress who looks exactly like, you, like your <laughs> shirt. We have pictures of this somewhere. Right. It looked like yeah. it literally coordinated <laughs> the way it, it did, was didn't written. it? Yeah. So, okay. Um, so I have one here that I want to run by you. It's somebody who's writing to me and not to the entire group, uh, somebody who, who do not wish to come on camera, but would like a, a little advice, and we're, I'm aware of the time, but would like, like a little advice from Ross Harris. And um, because we think that would be useful for us to hear your take on this. I haven't read it all because I'm pretty, uh, preoccupied but it's somebody who's in a relationship and this and it's a um, I think it's fair to say this is a woman uh, and she's not sure whether to stay or to leave she's not sure whether to uh, she wants uh, she's not sure whether to have a child with him and etc so I'm guessing that you you would so a client comes to you not sure, should I stay, should I go, should I get a child with this one? I'm not sure what to do. What would you, what would you, if you could offer, if you, you're at a bar, at, remember we're at the bar, somebody comes up and says, oh, I'm not sure what to do. There you are. Uh, I would say um, drink uh, Australian <laughs> champagne. <laughs> Mine's almost gone. <laughs> um, I actually, um, do you know, I, I've got a whole kind of thing about this. Uh, the uh, I'm gonna call it my uh, my ten step, my ten steps for any dilemma. Um, uh, it, it, so the basic uh, there's the first five steps are, are, are kind of um, uh, involve recognizing basically um, there's no simple easy answers for dilemmas because if there were, it wouldn't be a dilemma in the first place. Um, and, uh, you know, so you can do all the usual stuff, all the pros and cons and getting advice and oh, all of that's got its role, but sooner or later you realize that, you know, thinking about this, analyzing this, discussing this, writing lists of pros and cons is not going to resolve it for you. Um, so, uh, so do all your due diligence there and, and, and by all means, you know, I, I encourage uh, clients to kind of spend, you know, a little bit of time each day with a piece of paper or a, a, a document on a computer where they do write the pros and the cons um, and just see if there's anything new you can add to it each day. Um, usually by the time you spent about 15 or 20 minutes doing this, there's nothing more to add, you know? So, um, you know, you come, you say, all right, I've got no more pros, no more cons. Okay. So I don't need to spend the rest of my day thinking about this and analyzing about this. Um, and then, um, you know, the kind of the second five steps are really about the practicalities, you know? So each morning when you wake up, make a decision for the next 24 hours, am I staying or leaving? If you can't decide for 24 hours, then for the next 12 hours, for the next six hours, if you can't even decide that, then for the next one hour, am I staying in this relationship or leaving until the day that I kind of say I'm out of here and start packing my bags, I'm staying. So 
acknowledge that choice and then for the next 24 hours what values do i want to live by while i stay in this relationship for the next 24 hours or if it's only for the next hour what values do i want to live by for the next one hour in this relationship uh, and so obviously you know that brings up a lot of anxiety so acceptance self-compassion and basically uh, live your values every day acknowledging the choice you're making for this day to stay in this relationship or not and what will happen is over time is one of three things either um you know the decision will be made for you like the other person leaves or has a heart attack and dies or does something that makes it crystal clear for you that you need to leave this relationship. Like, they, you know, they organize, you know, they, they do something that just crosses all the, uh, the boundaries for you. And so there's no longer a dilemma there. I can't stay with this, you know, so either something happens that it's, uh, it's clear. Um, or um, you, uh, or the dilemma continues, um, uh, in which case ongoing self-compassion and every day acknowledging the, the choice that you're making. So, uh, you know, act, there's a saying in act, you know, uh, there's no way not to choose. There's no way not to choose. So every day until you pack your bags and leave that relationship, you're choosing to stay. So what values are you going to live for that next day? and the day after and the day after. And sometimes people take years and years, you know, I mean, um, if you talk to people who've gone through divorces, often they struggled and agonized with, with that decision for years before they finally made the decision to do it. Um, so, uh, you know, if clients come uh, to me in, in, in a therapy session and say, you know, I've got to resolve this, uh, you know, my immediate, uh, you know, I, I will say to them, you know, it's very unlikely you're going to resolve this in today's session. And they're like, what? What? I said, well, you know, how long have you been thinking about this? How long have you been struggling with this? You know, dilemmas like this don't usually get resolved in the space of 50 minutes with me. Sometimes they do, but probably not, you know. Um, that's a beautiful response. I I I, uh, I was having the uh, honor of speaking to Paul Gilbert just uh, the other week, and we were talking about dilemmas. And he he all you know it, on top of what you just said, um, I think he might add to it to have compassion for the struggles, to have compassion for I think you just said that too as well, Ross. But and he's, <laughs> so having compassion for the for the for the struggle that you're in, and then he said which one would you would you rather not grieve like so so if you were to grieve either the the loss of the relationship or to grieve staying in it with all that like which one would you least have that was just an interesting way of also yeah. have, you know being in a, in a dilemma interesting so mindful about the time the bar is closing ross so i want to go out into gallery view and just tap, so if you, can you see everybody's faces? Can you see happy people around the world in the bar with us, waving, <laughs> cheering? I can. <laughs> yeah, I can. So, <laughs> uh, I'm so happy that you all came here and joined us in the bar on this very informal uh, chat between uh, not only two friends, but 200 friends uh, hanging out here. And so um, for those of you who are in here, the next time I will do something like this, I have found somebody who will come and talk to us about body image. That's interesting. That's a cliffhanger. I'll let you more mm. know more. A lady who does a lot of work within body image. Um, and so Russ Harris, can we just see you and your champagne? Is, is there any more uh, left? It's, 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 it's kind of, oh yeah. Kind of gum. But, uh, I've got some water here. <laughs> it's kind of gum. Not the so, same. <laughs> so thank you everybody. So I'm going to ask Russ to, to hang on with me for a few minutes so that him and me can say goodbye. And I'm going to ask the rest of you to gently log off and... Uh, I will save the, the chat and give it to Russ so that we, um, that we see all your lovely feedback. And, you know, make sure to connect with us on social media and, and everywhere. And then thank you and goodbye. And we love you and take care and stay thank safe. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> see ya. How do you say goodbye in, in, in Danish? 
Pavel, or say hey do in Swedish. Hey do. <laughs> and what was the first one? Pavel. Hi, Pavel. Hi. Pavel. <laughs> there we go. <sighs>